All right, so our first up story is a fun one. It's kind of left over from Christmas, but that's okay. Uh, family's Rudolph decoration repeatedly attacked by real deer. Okay, so let's watch this video here. So Jason, yeah, I'll, go I'll give a little commentary yeah. here. I'm a deer hunter. Watch, watch these things happen in the woods all the time. So you've got a young white-tailed buck here, and the stationary deer you see in the middle is a archery target, white-tailed deer, that's oh, been, going down. <laughs> been decorated with a red nose. Uh, light bulb to represent Rudolph and this young buck is getting spunky and wanting to spar with this uh, other deer and he's just a yearling buck with a with a small little rack there and he's ready to take on this challenger <laughs> and he Put totally annihilates him and <laughs> puts him puts him in his place uh, when he goes to the ground it, I think it kind of spooks him and uh, as a hunter, you use decoys to bring in deer and things like that. So uh, I've seen this this type of thing happen lots of times in videos. And apparently and it happens every year. You and have to it, repair it every single year. And they said it's broken year. again. They're going to oh. have to go repair it for next year. I think it's so. I think it's fun. I think it's I fun. Do it. it is fun. I mean, after all, Rudolph was an outcast. So just saying. So yep. yeah, he's, he's still going, getting he's bullied. He's going down. Okay. Still getting bullied. <laughs> okay. More Americans view Salvation Army unfavorably after racial discussion guide controversy poll finds. Okay, so you may have heard about this. It's been in the news for a few weeks now, but the Salvation Army put on their website a discussion guide called Let's Talk About Racism, which had to do with their collaboration with what was called the International so Social Justice Commission. And in this guide, which you can no longer find online because they have taken it down now, but in this guide, there was, um, it was basically s supporting critical race theory, okay, which is the idea that basically if your skin is white or very light brown, um, you're automatically a racist and you're the oppressor and everyone else is oppressed by you. And so you need to repent of your sin of whiteness, uh, you know, all of those things which you may have heard uh, before. And so the Salvation army though is taking a lot of heat for having had this up on their website and um people you know at this time of year when people are normally giving more they're finding that people are viewing them unfavorably because yeah, many of people it. don't recognize that the salvation army is a denomination just like the southern baptist convention and other other groups are denominations and they did this as a way within their denomination to try and promote discussion about racial tension issues and those types of things and so they they had a committee within their denomination to bring these things to light. And this discussion guide was supposed to be a way to foster that discussion within their denomination. And then it was posted and we don't know all the backstory of how all these pieces played out, uh, but there were at least people within the denomination who were promoting these views, promoting these ideas and willing to um, foster these types of uh, what we would think of as woke documents and this, this woke ideology and put this up on their website and have this as a primary uh, discussion guide. And as we think about all these things, we've mentioned this before multiple times, but this comes out of a very Marxist framework and a really an anti-biblical framework as we get down to the roots of it. And it, it caused a great controversy. And rightfully, people were concerned about it. And as it was uh, brought to the attention of the uh, the broader denomination, they took it down, there were statements made back and forth, and the the group Color Us United, uh, the, the individual who was heading that up, um, he went and had dinner with one of the leaders of the, of the Salvation Army denomination, and there's been back and forth discussion, and there's still been this push, this campaign from this Color Us United group to get them to directly denounce these ideas and to say that America is not a racist country and the Salvation Army has come back and made these very explicit statements We're not trying to make political statements or, or any specific societal stands on any of these things But it's still a very interesting situation And we've really got to wait to see where all these pieces play out and and what's gonna happen with this It really is a reflection of how important it is as a larger entity that you are very aware of what's being associated with you yeah. I know here at Answers in Genesis, we're very careful about that as well because we want to make sure everything's in line, you know, with what we believe is biblical authority and God's word. And it had a significant effect. As we were saying, it was a really a mistake on the part of Salvation Army because they were talking about in the survey that they did, 
Voters who viewed the Salvation Army as very favorable or somewhat favorable dropped from 81% to 41%. That's a big drop. I mean, I would imagine their overall donations this season were significantly impacted from yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So it just, like here at Answers in Genesis, we have a, um, it's called the Editorial Review Board that has to review all content that we produce, whether it's a newsletter, a magazine, a website article, because we just have to be so careful that it really reflects who we are as a ministry. It's accurate. It's consistent. Um, and like I say, we see this over and over again, and that's why organizations, especially Christian organizations, need to be really careful. I did look at the Salvation Army website, and they do have quite a bit up there now talking about um, that the idea that we are a one race, um, that we, you know, it's just a matter of different skin shades. It's not that we're, you know, separated on those bases. And so they do seem to be doing a pretty good job of um, taking responsibility for this and trying to put out things that are, that don't go along with what the guy talked about, yeah. but, you know, we'll Now there see. are other issues. They've promoted things right. like homosexuality mm -hmm. and other problematic yeah. things in the past. So you still want to be That's wise it. and discerning about who you're giving your money to and what types of things they're supporting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Oxford University blasted for considering hiring based on woke score of academics. Okay. So apparently now there is a new score that people can get called your EDI score, your equality, diversity, and inclusion. Like how... How good are you, okay, when it comes to this? And um, even for academics, which, you know, being an academic, being in academia for years, it's, <laughs> I, I have a really hard time with this because I'm thinking, what happened to academic freedom, right? What happened to critical thinking? What happened to all of those things, right? They're going out the door in the name of wokeness, right? In the name of this diversity and inclusion, you have to think a certain way. And if you don't think that way, then you're out of the academy. Yeah. So basically, if you want to receive advancement in your department, if you want to get grants, if you want to get funding, if you want to have any type of benefit, if you want to get hired into a program, you've got to be able to prove how you've been including various groups in your research, how you intend to promote diversity, how you intend to do all these things. And not only in just vague terms, as our next story is going to define how you're going to do these in very concrete, defined ways. And this uh, professor, who's not named in this particular story for his own protection, I presume, at Oxford, is very concerned about this because it has the very real potential of undermining that academic integrity because now we're not going to be worried about how good the research is and the integrity of the research and how valuable it is. We're going to be worried about this secondary or tertiary issue of how inclusive this person was when they did their research, regardless of how valid or um, how meaningful the work was. And you just think about how much it's going to hinder scientific advancement yeah. because you're going to have all this solid, rich research from great scientists pretty much not receiving funding at all because they're just not considered mm -hmm. woke enough or they're not being specific enough or they're not including enough diversity. Uh, and we're actually going to talk about this in the next article how uh, I would say detail they need to be about that but right. we have a great resource too as well yeah so dealing with these types of issues uh, professor Owen Strand has written a great book called Christianity and wokeness and as a ministry we love to equip you guys to be able to think about these things and work through these things uh, so this is something our editorial review board has gone through and and uh, considers a very great resource for you uh, Dr. Vodi Bakum also has a great book dealing with these issues. And this book will help you think through a lot of those things, how to look at this, uh, this framework of social justice and the Marxist basis for a lot of these ideas and think about it from a biblical foundation and whether it's things that are coming up at work or in school, uh, things we're seeing in our culture all around us. Great resource for you to, to tackle those things and try to think about them biblically. Yeah, and, and one of the things they actually had shown in this article, a billboard from some New York, um, actually private school parents who are worried about these kind of woke ideas coming into their private schools because this has become an issue. And the billboard says, teach how to think, not what to think. And I agree with that, right? It, it really takes away that critical thinking aspect that's supposed to be part of your academic um, 
upbringing, shall we say, uh, teaching you how to take all of these ideas and these issues and think through them um, critically according to your worldview, according to your starting point, which for a Christian is going to be very different from someone who is not a Christian. And, and one of our speakers, Patricia Angler, just had a, mm -hmm. her book was recently published that yeah. directly addresses that topic and mm -hmm. tries to equip students with how to think critically. You know, called Prepare to Thrive, mm -hmm. you know, and how do you do this and do it well? And so that will be available very, very soon um, that you can take advantage of that for your young person because this is what they're going to be up against. And e even not just in secular settings, but in a lot of Christian settings as well. And so we're going to have to be prepared for that. So this next story goes along with that one. Professor of Color says he was denied funding for insufficient dedication to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay, so this is a chemistry professor that was born in India, but he actually works in Canada, <laughs> okay, so um, at McGill University, and he's been denied federal grants now, even though he's previously brought in nearly $7 million in grants uh, for his work on lasers, uh, he's been denied these grants because of his EDI, again, this equality, diversity, and inclusion statement um, weren't good enough. <laughs> from someone who is a minority, right? Even his statements aren't good enough to get him grants now. Yeah, so when I read this title and read through this, I, I retitled this, I often do that as I read through these, give it a new subtitle, the race gatekeepers have become racist. Because here you have this man of color, as they often use these words to think about this, and he has tried, as he, he explains here in this article, He's included women, and he says, he's talked about how in his report, he says, as a racialized minority from the third world, from three nations, and how with his lived experience, he can leverage those experiences to provide a more inclusive and equitable environment for an ever-increasing bandwidth of people aiming to do world-class laser science. He sees that racist attitude being um, projected onto him, and he doesn't want to do those same things to other people, and he actively promotes that in his lab and in his work and in his environment and yet he's being deemed not woke enough he's not doing enough things enough concrete steps enough planning enough and there's never enough you can't feed the woke monster enough it's never satisfied I like how they called the new EDI index, I like to say as the gatekeeper now mm -hmm. to whether you receive federal funding um, and actually they're saying the agency is not even looking at your scientific merit or all this research right. that he's done before. I mean, the, the value that he's contributed to society, and it's irrelevant now. Because they're going to give yeah. this money out. I mean, the federal government gives this money to people one way or the other. And so potentially somebody that has worse or bad research, right, bad science maybe that they're doing, but because their EDI score is higher, could get funded in place of somebody who's got really good research, but too generic of an EDI. And so that's, that's what we're going to run into. And again, it's very anti-science. I, I keep saying that. I feel like a broken record, but that's exactly what it is. We're just, in the name of wokeness, right, we're willing to even do things that are very anti-scientific. All right, moving on. How did life arise? A new study offers fundamental evidence for a disputed theory. Meet Luca, the ancestor you never knew you had. All right, so Luca stands for last universal common ancestor, right? And so basically they believe that there was a single-celled microorganism that eventually evolved into every living thing that we have today, both past and present and well in the future. Mm -hmm. And this is the largest circular, or not largest maybe, but one of the biggest circular arguments I have ever seen in my life. Because <laughs> I was reading through this and I'm like, wait a minute. So they're trying to figure out like, where did Luca get the energy to become Luca? Okay, where to do the things that Luca needs to do, like metabolism, you know, making energy, you know, do, you know, taking nutrients and breaking them down and growing and reproducing. Well, it turns out that Luca got that energy from its own metabolism. 
Well, that's convenient. Well, yeah. Where did that come from? That's so what we're saying. Where did yeah. that metabolism come from? <laughs> when we think about the uh, the idea of biological evolution, we have to have something that came before that. So biological evolution, you have to have a living organism that can then evolve. So we think backward, we might call that chemical evolution, how these chemicals assembled themselves through these naturalistic processes. And then before that, you have cosmological evolution how through the Big Bang. So we can think about those three big categories. So this is dealing with that first, how did life, the origin of life, that chemical evolution step. And as you, as you work through all of these things, uh, I was reading this first, uh, first paragraph here, and I just wanted to put on my dramatic movie trailer voice and read, <laughs> but scientists have long struggled to understand the biochemical processes, the energy itself that gave rise to Luca until now. Like they've <laughs> solved this whole puzzle and this, this big dramatic thing, but as, as Georgia said, it's just this circle that they've come to. And so they have, proposed in this paper, this study that they're analyzing, that life evolved or began in these hydrothermal vents deep in the ocean. And there have been lots of proposals about lightning striking some little warm puzzle, puddle like uh, Darwin proposed or other types of energy sources from outside. So these guys are saying, no, it came from inside of the reactions themselves. And these, these reactions are exergonic or exothermic. They give off their own energy and release these things. And so they go to the hydrothermal vents that are there today. Okay, so track this circle with me. If we think life originated in these hydrothermal vents and we go there today and we look for all these processes, they say there were 402 basic biochemical reactions that we need for a living a organism. A mirror, they a said. A, a mirror. mirror. Just a mirror. Need 402. 402. Just 402. These things have to happen simultaneously all together for a living organism to be there. And you we can't go just down, have one or two or three. No, like you have to have all of them complete. All together. Right? That's what's so important to realize. In one cell to basically be a living organism. We go down to these hydrothermal events. We sample it. We find all of those things happening. We've got amino acids. We've got lipids. We've got sugars. We've got all the different structures of, of DNA and all the things that we need there to happen. And we find all those things present. We find all the, the metabolic pathways that give the energy that we need. We find all these things present in the hydrothermal vents. So we know that they must have evolved in the hydrothermal vents. But wait a minute. You just assumed that they started in the hydrothermal vents. So you've just done what we call in logic the begging the question fallacy. So you've looked in the place you thought they started to find the answer to where they started. So really all this has done is... Nothing. made of giant logical <laughs> fallacy to prove the point that you started with. So we really have nothing here, yeah, scientifically not speaking, other than a lot of conjecture and things Absolutely. that we've Absolutely nothing we've observational before. once again, right? Completely, nope. right? Just no. ideas, crazy ideas. And I love the very first paragraph because in the very first paragraph, or it's like what, maybe four sentences, they use the words believe, likely resembled, theorized, struggled sure. to understand. They, all the, whenever you read any type of scientific article like this and they're making these claims, look for those words because it's just showing that they're just making mm -hmm. all this up and they're just guessing. They have no idea. And they don't explain. I mean, metabolism, I mean, when things metabolize things, when they make things, like amino acids, which are the basis of proteins, okay, the single components of protein, that's a very complex process. I mean, you have to have a lot of things in the right order at the right time to do that. And so not, this paper doesn't explain where any of that originated, right? It just assumes it's there and somehow that this, you know, this was incorporated into a cellular organism. And was there water there or not? Right. And they don't know that. They say, well, there's a lot of theories out there on that and no one really knows. So again, it's just a bunch of storytelling with absolutely no basis in the evidence. There's no evidence to support what they're Maybe saying. Maybe it came from the multiverse. Which is our next article. <laughs> All right. Nice lead in there. How real is the multiverse? So if you have watched the new Spider-Man movie... Which was very good, by the way. You know <laughs> it's like real, it. right? Okay. All right, so how real is the multiverse? Now, this one is also based on a lot of evolutionary assumptions. In this case, cosmological evolutionary assumption. And they're basically, it, again, it's a bunch of stories because they, they say, in fact, it would be impossible to find direct evidence of their existence. 
Okay, so if you can't find direct evidence of a multiverse, which is another universe outside of our universe, then how can you ever actually determine that? That's not science. So basically what this paper science has fiction. done is developed a philosophical framework to think about how the, uh, talking about the Big Bang, cosmological evolution, how that Big Bang explosion needed this period of inflation, which is really just a fudge factor that they had to add into uh, the Big Bang to match what we call the cosmic background radiation, the smoothness of that, and how that would have repeated itself in this period of an eternal inflation and how that could have created eternal universes and eternal inflation, but that only based on a certain sample. And <laughs> did that really fit all the different models that were out there? But then they neglect that there could be models that aren't just naturalistic. The one model that they absolutely can never bring into the equation is the biblical model, that God created all of these things, that we don't need to explain all of these things by simply naturalistic, materialistic processes, that God spoke all of this creation into existence in six days that were 24 hours and he's already told us how he did it we don't need to imagine all these multiverses because god's told us how he created the universe my favorite part was how they basically ended the whole article and it just says their answer it's complicated and it's tough to say and it's tough to say so it's complicated and it's tough to say yeah exactly and why that we can watch Spider-Man and enjoy the multiverse, right? <laughs> um, it's science fiction, right? We know that. It's not, you know, it's not real. It's not true. But again, you just see them trying to come up with a way. A, a lot of these articles, it seems like, have been, you know, focusing on, even ones we did last week, have been focusing on this whole philosophical idea, mm -hmm. but they're not really based on anything evidentiary. They're just philosophical ideas to try to support their ideas about the past. All right. Atheist Washington Post columnist bemoans ideas babies have souls, says she'd feel nothing if her mother aborted her. So um, this is Kate Cohen, and she is a self-declared atheist, and I will give Kate Cohen credit. She is absolutely consistent with her worldview. Okay, so her worldview is that we are basically just bags of chemicals, and when we die, there's nothing more. Um, we start out that way, we end that way, and so if that's true, then there is no soul, there is no spirit, there's nothing non-material or immaterial. And so, sure, I can see why she's saying what she's saying. I don't agree with it, but she's at least, uh, and this is unusual, because a lot of times atheists aren't consistent with their worldview. She's being consistent. I can see why she's saying what yeah. she's saying. And these comments are stemming from the Supreme Court case, Dobbs v. Jackson, which... Uh, is relating to this Mississippi law and how that's uh, impacting what uh, she would think of as health care or abortion. And uh, the discussion that that's brought up, especially around the idea of uh, Justice Amy Coney Barrett suggested uh, using adoption as a way to care for uh, these children who would be born, who would otherwise be aborted. And that's brought up all these concerns by those who call themselves pro-choice and they say well that takes away the freedom of the of the mothers and they're going to lose that freedom and so in her comments she says if she were the baby she would rather not exist and give her mother the freedom to be able to live and exist and that's kind of the the core of her her argument because she doesn't believe in the existence of a soul and it really concerns her that there's a lot of religious language being used, especially uh, by legislators that she mentions, of the soul of the child and a pre-birth and a, a pre-life and an afterlife. And that language is really concerning to her. Yeah, what I found really interesting is in the very first paragraph, she actually, they talk in the article, they say, she bemoaned the fantas fantastical and scary idea that people have souls. And they even put scary in quotes. And I'm, mm -hmm. the fact they would even use that word scary to describe the fact that people may have souls shows that she knows the truth, mm -hmm. that there must be a soul and there must be more, right? Suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. And that's what we see over mm -hmm. and over again. The law is written on our hearts and everyone knows, right? They just choose to suppress that truth. And I would say too, the issue is not how the unborn child feels, right? This, is not, this isn't about that. It's about the fact that this unborn child is, bears the image of God, right? And that's what why that unborn child, mm -hmm. yeah, what is that child? It is an image bearer. That child is, 
bears the image of God and therefore that life is precious, right? That's why we called it the Life is Precious Conference that we talked about earlier because that life has a right to life because it bears the image of God. And she and, has a religious view she's expressing just like we do. Right, We're exactly. not shy about expressing mm -hmm. that. We, we will say, yes, we are basing our view on what God's word clearly mm -hmm. says about those things. Yeah, yeah. All right, moving on to global warming. Well, sort of. All right. <laughs> Scientists reveal the surprising cause of the Little Ice Age. All right, so this happened about 600 years ago that there was a cooling of the earth. Okay, this was, um, you can read about it. We talk about it uh, actually on the ark. We yeah. talk about the mm -hmm. Little Ice Age. And so what they found, there was very warm temperatures in the late 1300s, followed by very cold condition and only 20 years later in the early 1400s that lasted for a period of time. And what they have found is that, well, what they think they found. Okay, I should, should be careful <laughs> with this. What they think they found based on their modeling, all right, and Roger will talk a little bit about that in a minute, but is that they think a lot of really warm water moved north, which is normal, okay? The warm water will move north part of the year, but a lot of it, a lot of really warm water moved north. And as a result, it melted a lot of the icebergs and things, which then cooled the water down and caused this little ice age in the years to follow. Yeah, so this unusually warm episode was triggered by this event. And they say that they've created a 3,000 year reconstruction of the North Atlantic sea surface temperatures. How in the world can you do that with any degree of certainty or accuracy with real data? Now, I'm, I'm sure they're trying to correlate this to certain rock structures and things like that and, and all of the different things that they're trying to do, but we can't do that with any degree of accuracy that's really going to give us hard science. And so as we look at those things, even looking at those numbers, that's gonna put us in a biblical time frame way back past the flood. So we can't accept those numbers as being accurate. And they also acknowledge in this that this was a time of the solar activity being very high and, and different volcanic activity and the level of that. So as we consider the sun's activity, the volcanic activity, how all those things are influencing the climate, those things create these extremely challenging things to try and understand. And we didn't have sensors to be able to detect all of those things at that time. And, and we can try to look at some clues and hints and, and see those things uh, in in rock layers and trees and, and determine some of those things, but it's really unpredictable. And they make that statement very clear here, even though they're not willing to accept their own statement. According to the scientists, this collapse triggered a substantial global cooling event and other climate processes currently at play could have quite unpredictable results. We don't know what's going to happen in these massive large scale events. And they end the article by saying they go, climate models do not capture these events reliably, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to remember it's just a model. And even when they're analyzing data, someone had to build that model and likely put a certain amount of assumptions in place there. And so it's very easy when you have models like this to sometime produce results that you're looking for. And it's all natural too. When you think about it, like even if this model is true, think about it, this was not man caused at all, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the global warming that occurred and the little ice age that followed was all due to natural causes. And so they're not willing to take that into um, a consideration a lot of times because again, they, there's a lot of money to be made um, if it's made by man. And so they want to push that idea, even again, even though there's not a lot of evidence to actually support that. All right, well, we're out of time for today. So we'll see you back on Monday.